Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. Get our complimentary newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. Starting a new weekly feature, the person I'm going to introduce to you, somebody I've met through various professional affiliations. Her name is Diana Zappa. She has been working with the Daily Bell, one of the foremost libertarian websites in the world out of Switzerland. She's got an amazing story to tell, and she's wired into everything that I think you want to hear. You want to hear about how libertarianism works. You want to hear about how socialism fails, and you want to hear what you can do about what's happening in the world, how you protect yourself and your family. Diana's been doing that. Diana. Hi, Kerry. How are you today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, well, I just thought that uh, when I heard your story and the way that you've gotten into this area of the media, that we needed to do a show together. Well, I think it's a fantastic idea. I'm uh, very excited to participate. And it's really great to have you on. You mentioned to me that your father was a silver coin collector and that he had a big impact on your life in that regard. Tell us, what's the story behind that? Well, yes, my father did collect coins always, and they were always handed over to, I have three siblings, and uh, so our weekly allowance was some sort of a silver coin save it. He ended up saving it, of course, because, you know, we'd be rushing to the candy store if it was possible. But uh, anyways, the idea that we would receive a silver coin. Over the years, uh, he has still saved them, and every time he comes to visit me, he's got a bag full, and I think he just continues to collect them along the way and pass them on, and, uh, you know, his intention is is, you know, the same as many from his generation that he understands and did understand that, uh, you know, the government was debasing the money and um, and that you have to have uh, gold and silver backing your currency. Yeah. And, you know, he knows that value and uh, he's passed that along. So this is just another case of the older you get, the smarter your parents get, huh? <laughs> Well, I guess that can be part of it. But uh, of course, you know, my own education has made some major changes towards that. And I feel that, uh, you know, the last five, six years of my involvement in this industry, my husband is in the mining industry, gold and silver in particular. And uh, I have, you know, been very awakened about uh, what is really happening in the world about currency. And um, silver, gold has always been money. It's all through history. It's always been money. Government have always tried to debase it. And, um, and you know, so here we are in the year of 2012 with, you know, absolutely no gold and silver of any kind uh, in our currency other than what people hold. And uh, people need to understand that it needs to be a part of our everyday lives again. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's interesting in that your father told you that from a young age and I guess you're Canadian, and in America, we just kind of shrugged off when they switched the coins in circulation from silver to, as uh, David Morgan calls it, the Johnson slugs, which are a copper nickel cladded coin that has virtually little or no intrinsic value. We just shrugged it off, but I remember the day that I found out about it, my brother came into the kitchen all excitedly and he said, they're taking the silver out of the coins. And I'm like five or six years old. And he takes like, he's got a handful of quarters of the silver ones and he drops them on the floor and they sound really solid. They ring. And then he drops the new ones, the 1965 quarters, and they sounded tinny and hollow and 
not worth anything, just the sound. And that kind of led me to where I'm at today, where espousing the value of real money and that you need to acquire real money because this paper stuff could be gone in the wink of an eye. So it's kind of interesting that we both wound up in a similar place from similar events in a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just talking about, you know, what the difference of how a coin sounds. uh, I remember that very same discussion, you know, with our family and uh, and learning the you know, that this was going to be a change over in time. And of course, you didn't, you know, being the age that we were, didn't understand really what that implication meant at the time. And as we've gotten older and learned that a dollar bill is not the value of a silver dollar that it used to be, you know, you just start to understand, you know, start to realize that the industry and the currency situation has radically become in the control of the government and that the government to basement continues all through time and they will do whatever it takes to continue to debase it as we move through history. And now we're into a place where it's not going to stop. I mean, or it's, you know, it's the idea to go back to a gold standard is probably not realistic at this point, but I certainly think that if the dollar collapses or if it gets to that point, you're going to see a lot more barter and people are going to use small items. I mean, you know, do not give away your mom's silver. Do not give away any, you know, jewelry, any kind of silver jewelry or uh, gold jewelry. Keep that and keep those in places where if, you know, if things do collapse, you're going to have a bit of a resource to use. Yeah, I think that's really essential. Actually, I have a friend who runs a check cashing operation and a major part of his business is buying mm-hmm. gold and silver at <laughs> deeply, steeply discounted prices And I just say to him, like, why do people sell this? And he says, they need the money. And I guess that's it. They don't view it as money. Yeah. Well, I think that the barter system will become more and more prevalent in these next few years we're going to see. And I'm sure people are doing it already. And of course, I mean, you know, money and currency, the value of it is based on whatever two parties deem currency to be. If you're selling bread and I'm cutting hair and we deem that as an exchange, then that's a currency exchange. And I think that, you know, I mean, I think one of the last free markets that really exist in the world today or one of the only free markets that exist in that sense is, you know, the drug world. Yeah. You know, I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, they're out there, they set the price, they do whatever. I mean, there's no regulation on it, which of course is another whole conversation. It's funny you mention that any black market is a free market effectively because it's free of government control, but it's affected by the government's declaring whatever it is illegal so that there's a risk involved and then the profits derive from the risk that the government imposes on that market because you know, cocaine might sell for a thousand dollars a pound in Bolivia where there's no enforcement and it'll sell for whatever the price is in the States here. And the whole differential in that price, it isn't that any value got added to it. It's just that the drug distribution cartel or company is getting rewarded for the risk that they're willing to take of going to jail or getting into a gunfight with other gangs or law enforcement. So it's interesting though, that all black markets are unregulated And the pricing there, you have true price discovery, unlike in our legal markets that we have now that are totally rigged and manipulated. As uh, Ed Steer said to me yesterday when I was interviewing him from Casey Research, he said, all the markets are a total rig job. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah, it is. And so people like us are out here. We're trying to educate on a grassroots level, which I think is the key to getting people to realize that this is the reality. And I think that, you know, things are becoming more transparent, but, you know, are people really caring is the, you know, the next, it comes down to a human spirit and what is it take for people to realize that, you know, they have to get, you know, to a moral level where they understand this is really what's going on and to, to make that change and to stand in a place and say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to accept this anymore and let's get moving forward so that we can start to, uh, you know, better our lives. 
for sure. And I have a new sponsor called Regal Assets and the president of Regal Assets, this guy, Tyler Gallagher, I had this exact conversation with him. When are people going to wake up? What are you going to do? When are you going to become aware of how corrupt the system is, that it's stealing from you, that it's draining your wealth away and effectively giving your wealth to the wealthy? And he said, you'll become aware when the system stops working and you have to. That's the majority yeah. of the population. They're just not going to do it otherwise, are they? No. And I would like to think that people are trying to make themselves better on a regular basis. In my life, I work a number of different elements. And of course, finance and economics are and can be some of the most boring discussions that there are for mm -hmm. many. But you won't be that bored when you don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, they'll be interested, huh? All of a sudden, there's going to be a major concern there. And I think people are starting to, and this isn't a joke or a laughing matter. I mean, this is, you know, reality is starting to happen that our dollar is so debased and becoming so valueless. And so why does it cost $5 to buy a, a loaf of bread? I mean, it's not that it takes anything different to create that or that, you know, the costs associated with it are different. It's because the dollar is worth less. And so it buys less. And so, so, I mean, so many people are going to feel that coming up and many people are already. And so how do you protect yourself? And I think this, you know, brings us back to the earlier conversation. You know, how do you protect yourself from understanding that you have to, you know, saving money, of course, is one way. Is, you know, saving your money is something that not everybody does in our Western environment, but that's less and less all the time <laughs> because there's less too. But I guess you know, it's it's understanding that you have to live within your means and living beyond your means is just such a Western philosophy in the last 20, 30 years. And I feel that, you know, we could have lived in our time. I mean, both of us are in, we're baby boomers. And so we've seen all kinds of greatness in America. And I think we're on the tipping point of, of something a little bit different for the next 20 or 30 years. Oh, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And when you talk about waking people up, trying to get them to understand, I think your work at the Daily Bell, probably instrumental in waking up a lot of people around the world. Just how did you get into that and how did you wind up uh, working uh, with the Bell? Well, uh, it was a uh, partnership that was established. My husband and um, the directors of the Bell were in business in different projects, mining in particular, and Anthony Weil, who is the ex and the founder of the Daily Bell was looking for different people in marketing. And my background is marketing and project management. And uh, so I said wholeheartedly that I was very interested to be involved. And of course, in communications. And he offered me a position to work, you know, in interview assistant, basically. And that meant, you know, running the interview department at the Bell. And so we targeted lists of, you know, names and different people that we were interested to interview and then I started the process. I've been working with them for over four years now and uh, it completely has changed my life, my opinion about the world and uh, it, it brought some real realizations about why I, I understand now. I am a bit not that I don't like to use the term rebellious too much but um, I definitely have some ideas about the world that were answered very clearly when I got and uh, you know, realized I was a libertarian. And um, so it took five or six years to really put this under my belt and realize that this is the direction. And all of a sudden, a lot of answers came into place. Part two is available to subscribers of financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Go there now, sign up and enjoy.